Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Triple Dividend, Investing in Gender Equality Within the Global Health Workforce. Well, my name is Andrea Winkler and I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Global Health at the University of Oslo. And I will be your co-host today together with Dr. Rupa Dax, and she is the co-founder and executive director of Women in Global Health. The discussion and the webinar is organized by Women in Global Health and Women in Global Health Norway. So what, what is Women in Global Health? Women in Global Health is a global movement that brings together all genders and backgrounds to achieve gender equality in global health leadership. And Women in Global Health Norway is a national chapter supporting the global movement by also hosting, but also hosting a platform and providing a collaborative space for discussions around gender equity in global health, but on a national level. Before we start, just a few housekeeping issues. When you registered, so this is now to the participants, when you registered to the webinar, you agreed for the session to be recorded so that we can make the link available to all those that are not able to join live and also potentially store the webinar in an archive. And all participants' microphones and videos will remain inactive throughout the session, but you can participate. I will let you know. So the webinar will start now with some high level introductory remarks, followed by a brief explanation on the triple dividend by Rupa Dutt, which will then set the scene for our panel discussion. And the panel discussion will be co-moderated by Rupa and myself. And then this again will be followed by open Q&As, and this is where you as participants can participate. So, you are most welcome, so please do engage. And you have to use the question and answer function. So you have to type in the questions. We will then read out the questions that are suitable, of course, uh, also in the time slot that we've got. So without further ado, we are very honored to host uh, this high level discussion and a special warm welcome and thanks to our panelists today. And first, allow me to introduce Mr. Axel Jakobsen, the Norwegian State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's a real pleasure to see you again, and we are looking forward to hearing your reflections. So please, uh, Axel Jakobsen. I think you have to unmute. You, you unmute still, Axel. Yes. Thank better. you, Andrea. And uh, I hope you can hear me well now. Very well. Ministers colleagues and, and good friends. Thank you. Thank you also for organizing this very timely event. Uh, let me start by <clears throat> going to the literature. We, we all heard about or even read hospital romance books. It's a long standing literary genre, still very much alive. They all have one thing in common. The doctor is a man and the nurse is a woman. I think a relevant question today for today's webinar is why not the other way around? Um, the fact is that segregation by gender in the health sector is universal and prominent. We have, you know, women make up 70% of the global health workforce. That's the official number. And if you take women's unpaid work into account, the number would be higher. Half of women's health work is unpaid on a global basis. The value of their work, however, is outstanding. Look, for example, on what has been achieved over the last couple of decades with respect to child mortality and maternal health. It could not have been ha happened without female health workers, paid, unpaid, and underpaid. And from my own experience, I have been working for five years for the, the Global Vaccine Alliance, Gavi, and wherever we went, there was always women who did the, the immunization projects. And, and I've seen some of my, my um, met some of my biggest heroes when I was out there and, and met with, for instance, young girls doing immunization work in, in the villages of Afghanistan. Uh, they are really heroes. Another important number is 28. Women earn 28 percent less than men within the sector. Even when you look at the same job categories, men earn 11% more than women on average. 
Also in Norway, we see this very clearly. 83% of the health sector personnel are female and only about 11% of the nurses are male. The World Health Organization, the Global Health Workforce Network and Women in Global Health published an important report a year ago, delivered by women, led by men, a gender and equity analyst, analysis of the global health and social workforce. As illustrated by the title, the global and often also the national and local health institution are led by men, despite the fact that women form an overwhelming majority among employees. This lack of gender balance in health leadership means that we lose women's knowledge and perspectives in this sector. These perspectives are more important than ever. Know that there is a global demand for employees in the health sector. We need tens of millions of new health workers. The fact that the world is facing a global health crisis makes it even more urgent to close this gap. So I look forward to today's discussion on how we can turn around the gender deficit in health leadership. There are many arenas to work on. I will come back to some of them during the panel de debates. In the midst of crisis lie opportunities. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought global health to the very top of the international agenda. Uh, and we also in Norway have, have turned around our budgets uh, and, and, and are investing much more into global health. And we must not waste this opportunity do, that this gives us to advance towards gender equality within the health workforce. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Axel. Um, really appreciate your comments and acknowledgement about the gender gap and also just the critical role um, of the health workforce and particularly women in the health workforce. Um, today's session is very much focused on adopting gender transformative policies um, and really addressing gender inequities in global health and investing in decent work for the female health workforce. And what we really talk about in this is that there is a multiplier effect um, society-wide and economic-wide that we call the triple gender dividend. Um, there are three parts to this. The first is really the health dividend um, uh, through creating millions of new jobs uh, for women in health and social care. There will be a growing demand um, that we will be able to meet, especially to achieve universal health coverage. Um, the second aspect of it is really the gender equality dividend. We know that when we invest in women um, and the education of girls to enter formal jobs, this will increase gender equality, women's empowerment, women's gain in income, um, education, autonomy, and that in turn will really help close the gender gap. And the third part is really the development dividend. We know that once um, uh, girls and women are able to have better health, better uh, um, gender equality, um, then there is also um, better education and new jobs that will fuel both national and global economic growth. And we frame today's discussion very much about being an investment and a return on investment because it is truly the way um, we will have stronger, more resilient health systems. Um, so uh, Axel, in your statement, you really talked about a uh, very critical need to invest in global health, but also in gender equality. Um, it, you know, what are some ways that you see in order to close the gender gap? How could we really work in these areas? Um, what is Norway doing as one of the leaders in, in gender equality work more broadly? Uh, but how do you see some of your investments as a country directly in healthcare, um, in training and in education, incorporating gender transformative approaches in the training of health workers, both nationally and in, um, in, in your investments around the world. Um, um, uh, yes, we're not uh, able to hear you. Uh, yes, um, I forgot the, the mute button. That happens a lot these days. <laughs> But uh, let me start by saying that I do think the world is moving in a, a right direction regarding the closing the gender gap. I read in the WHO report that if we move at the same speed as today, it will take us 200 years to achieve gender balance in the health sector. So no doubt we, we need to speed up. And uh, I think we need, do need to work on several arenas. Uh, I believe that national and local health authorities are among the most important arenas. We need to revisit and reinvigorate gender perspectives in this dialogue. 
in our dialogue with our partner countries, we, we do underline the importance of gender equality in society and the benefits this would provide, including in the health tech sector. This is really a key for the whole society uh, to, 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 um, to, and, and really to see development. We, we, there, the key is to empower women, and especially so in the health sector. Uh, and one example of, of our work is, um, is the specific intervention to ensure equitable participation of men and women in higher education and equal opportunities for career development and leadership position. That is one perspective when Norway invests in healthcare training and education in many developing countries. I could mention some other areas there. It would be very important to work with ILO and its member states to ensure enforcement of convention number 100 on equal remuneration. And we need also to work with WHO to re revisit the WHO Global Code of Practice of the International Recruitment of Health Personnel. And we should work on, on the international arenas to ensure that sexual and reproductive health and rights are firmly supported and strengthened. Um, when it, lastly, let me mention when it comes to international migration of health workers, often leads to female health personnel ending up in vulnerable situation. The WHO Global Code of Practice on International Recruitment of Health Personnel is an instrument that could be revisited. It concerns both regional arrangement and bilateral arrangement agreements that should uh, secure rights of personnel and, and where female personnel are not explicitly part of the code. Uh, so this might be an, an an, area, an important area for improvement from now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm going to turn it to, uh, to uh, Andrea. Well, th thanks a lot, uh, State Secretary, and thanks, Ropa. Um, I just have a small announcement. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Joyce um, Moriko Kaduku. Um, who is the Minister of Primary Health Care of Uganda, was not able to make it today because of her high commitment in the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, so we're going to move uh, straight to Dr. Magda Robalo-Silva. So uh, Dr. Robalo, you are the High Commissioner for COVID-19, uh, right at the office of the President in Guinea-Bissau. We just uh, talked about reshuffling some of the questions. I'm very, very happy that you will take on at least one question that we would have asked Dr. Kaduku. So I'm going to go right there. Um, Magda, what role do you see women having in the health workforce as we talk about advancing universal health coverage and the health dividends? You need to unmute, Magda. We can't hear you. Yes. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, the question you ask, what role do I see women having in um, advancing the universal health coverage agenda um, and um, the health dividend? I think the discussions around achieving the universal health coverage uh, now that we are left with only 10 years um, to, to 2030 and we don't uh, even know uh, the um, extent of the negative impact of this pandemic on our ability to move smoothly towards 2030 and achieve the universal health coverage. I think that brings an even more important role for women in uh, working towards uh, UHC. I think the role of the women in the health workforce is very well known, very well established after uh, the reports and the studies that have been published recently. The women are there. They are the backbone of the health workforce, the majority of the health workforce, the nurses, the uh, doctors, uh, the uh, care, um, home care and uh, uh, supporters of families in providing uh, care, taking care of the children. The problem we have is the visibility of women and the role they play 
in shaping the policies and leading um, the policies for achieving the UHC and other uh, policies that are required for the world to be a better place for our, all of us. So I think unless we work in progress on gender equality, removing the barriers for women and men having the same pay and having the same opportunities to access and um, lead um, the, the, the response, lead the, 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 the policies, lead the transformation that is required in our societies, we will not be able to achieve any of the dividends we are talking about. So the role um, for women is in positions of leadership, not by um, administrative promotion, not by uh, uh, removing uh, the, uh, the same requirements that uh, are there for men and women to get there, but by removing the barriers that are preventing women from uh, achieving positions of leadership. If we work on that, I'm sure um, the, the, we'll be able to maximize uh, the contribution of women uh, in achieving universal health coverage. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Roballo. What is there anything else from a public health perspective um, when, you, when you think about health system strengthening? Is there anything else you want to let us know where women specially contribute and, and how can this be integrated into health system strengthening? Just a couple of sentences. Health system strengthening is, um, is a big uh, concept to mean uh, that uh, you, uh, the people, have the care they need, the services they need, when they need them, and where they are. So women as a um, key element of the health workforce, as mothers and take care of uh, leading um, families, uh, very often in many uh, developing countries, you have women as the uh, the sole provider uh, for, for the family. So um, strengthening the systems, giving access, financial, geographic, to uh, quality health services will still require that we give women the, uh, the leadership they need uh, or not give the leadership they need. Probably that's not the way I should phrase it. Uh, removing the barriers uh, that prevent women from leading from center, left, right, and behind, uh, in order for the policies to be to be to be implemented. And this is not just in the health sector. Um, for health sector to move forward, we need uh, women leadership in other sectors, in the education sector. We need women to lead in the economy and the financial sector, uh, so that the policies can be uh, implemented in a really transformative way and changing the way uh, we are dealing with businesses uh, that lead to better healthcare in the world. Well, thanks a lot, Magda, for this very, very comprehensive answer. Just the last question to you. And as we are in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and as you have just mentioned, Magda, the health workforce, uh, the, 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 corner, the cornerstone of the health workforce is, are the women, is female. And uh, how is that uh, reflecting within the COVID-19 pandemic? How uh, is now investing in a gender equitable health workforce even more important to be able to maintain it within times of pandemic? I think um, this pandemic um, is, um, uh, brought to our uh, face, to the face of the world, uh, the lack of investment we have been making in preparedness, uh, the lack of investment we have been making in health infrastructure, but also the lack of investment in uh, gender equality. Uh, what we are seeing uh, happening in our uh, countries, in our health sector, and uh, the, the shutdown uh, of the entire societies of the world uh, as a uh, uh, um, as a whole, uh, as a result of this pandemic, uh, tells us that if we don't go back to business as usual, we will not be able to have a better world. This pandemic, uh, if I take the example of Guinea-Bissau, if we don't do better from where we are right now, 
we are having, we are going to have 12% increase on maternal mortality. That's a huge setback on progress that has been made over the past 10 years in terms of reducing maternal mortality. We are going to have around um, 70,000 children who will not be immunized. We are going to have around um, 18,000 women who will not have access to family planning services. That's going to be a huge setback caused by this pandemic to the life of women in Guinea-Bissau. That will take us back more than um, the, the, the 10 years that it took us to, to get to this place. Hmm. In a nutshell, to say, um, unless we invest in gender uh, equality policies, unless we dedicate time and energy to remove the barriers that are preventing women from leaving from left to right, behind and center, we, uh, the humanity will not progress after this pandemic. So the COVID-19 is an opportunity for us to strengthen uh, the things we know uh, we need to do in order for uh, reducing uh, the barriers to gender equality and promoting women to the right place where they should be uh, as leaders of development uh, and for us to achieve the triple dividend. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Robalo Silva, for your very insightful replies and comments. And I hand back over to Rupa. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, th thank you, Andrea. So um, we're very uh, fortunate to also have a, um, a different perspective um, that is contributing to really understanding the triple gender dividend. Um, uh, delighted to welcome uh, Ms. Vanessa Monger, the Director of Gender, Women, and Civil Society at the African Development Bank. Um, Vanessa, you know, you're uh, at the intersection of really the finance world and gender, and one of the great things about your work is that it is your business to invest in gender equality. Um, and from your perspective, um, what opportunities do you see specifically in um, the health sector to promote economic empowerment of women and girls, especially on the continent of Africa? Well, thank you very much, Rupa, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's still morning here in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, and hello to all the fellow distinguished panelists. Indeed, I think women's access to health is one of the pillars of economic empowerment. It's one of the pillars of any sorts of empowerment, to be very frank. And uh, the interactions between the health of women and girls and their economic empowerment are very much self-evident for us. A healthy population is a working and productive population. And when women and girls are empowered with access to health services and the ability to voice their choices and control their bodies, you start seeing very, very important positive feedback loops occurring. And their participation in the labor force is increased. They can earn more income. The welfare of their families and communities is improved. We have research that shows that when women earn a revenue, they reinvest about 90% in the education, nutrition, and health of their families. So that's the kind of positive feedback loop I'm talking about. You ensure that the entire community benefits. But without access to these basic services, from food to nutrition programming to family planning, sexual and reproductive health, uh, women and girls cannot unleash their full potential and be fully contributing uh, to, to society's growth as they should. And even though we know that, we still have relatively weak health systems with unequal access, unmet needs, and we know we need to rebuild health systems that provide access to all and that take the women's needs specifically into account. So if you take sexual and reproductive health and rights in particular, well, access to health in this sector, access to these services, to me is both a right and an essential public good. Because beyond saving lives, it opens opportunities for women and girls to stay in school, to live healthier, more productive lives, and to contribute to the economy, as I was saying before. And when you look at it, less maternal and child death as well, in addition to the whole moral argument, results in savings in healthcare costs as well, and acceleration of the demographic transition, which helps the economy overall. Yet every day, sexual and reproductive health and rights of too many women and girls on the continent continue to be compromised. And we've seen it even more during the crisis. We have high unmet needs for family planning that result in unwanted pregnancy, that compromise future life chances, 
and so on, as I was talking about. You get into the negative feedback loops, and too often, women and girls can just not access the primary healthcare overall and cover their health expenses, which prevents them from making the choices I was talking about. So that's one of the big challenges that I see we can turn into an opportunity, because if we empower them with this access to all these services, along with education, because I think you need to look at things holistically, we can really fully empower women to be productive agents of our societies, because they are already the drivers and the backbones of African economies. The continent actually has the highest percentage of women entrepreneurs in the world, for example, with one in four women starting or managing a business. They need to have access to that. Yet, they're struggling uh, with, uh, you know, to survive different kinds of challenges. They typically have smaller businesses in the informal sector, fewer employees, less access to capital, struggling with uh, health coverage and all the likes. We've known for a while on the continent that our growth wasn't including inclusive enough but well, we cannot continue to move forward and leave behind the majority of our people. And if we can ensure equal access to all resources, women will deploy the power I was talking about. And to make sure they, they do that, in addition to access to services, we also need to make sure they can have access to business opportunity. And that means finance, training, information, network to play their part. And we've launched recently an affirmative program, Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa. And why am I talking about access to finance in this context? Because we also see the health sector as a huge opportunity for wealth creation, for business creation, for women to lead and grow businesses in the sector that will also employ more women and continue to create these positive feedback loops. And so looking at that, because of the crisis, we've repurposed some of our, our work and in collaboration with the Women Finance Entrepreneur Initiative of the World Bank, we're looking at directing eight to $12 million of investment through equity funds for impact funds and equity funds for women entrepreneurs that are repurposing their businesses and using new technologies to help in the prevention, the testing, the treatment, and increasing access and delivery of essential medical household food and other items. Uh, that are pertinent to the response to the pandemic or to future shocks, because they can also be empowered from the economic sector perspective. So for all of this to happen though, for women's needs to be taken into yeah. account in the health sector, in the business sector, in access to finance, they need to be represented at all level. We need to have diversity in our decision-making mechanisms and in our leadership circles at all level from the top to the bottom of society so we can ensure that everyone's needs are taken into account so that everyone can then fully participate. I'll stop here for now. Okay, great. Well, Vanessa, that was really uh, insightful to hear, especially about your perspective about the feedback loop and specifically, um, you know, some of your key points about seeing the health sector as a means of economic empowerment for particularly women and that you have um, already started in COVID-19 times allocating funds through um, the investment uh, bonds and uh, equity funds. Um, and just sort of building on that, what policies do you think are needed in the health sector um, to keep it gender equitable and for women to be able to, as participants in the health sector, um, uh, both as women in the health workforce, um, but also women as uh, entrepreneurs in the health sector that are probably coming out of the health workforce? How do we keep it gender equitable? And, and you talked about representation, but what policies um, have you seen that are emerging um, and have a proven track record. Yes, indeed. I mean, the policies, the policy environment is extremely important. And that's why I was so grateful to listen to the previous speakers on that aspect, because it really, that's where it all starts. This is where you create the environment for things to work, for the private sector to flourish, but for citizens to have access to the essential services that they need. And within the context of the crisis, the African Development Bank is increasing its dialogue with governments of the, of the region to see how we can also support them from, uh, with some of our budget support tools and with some of the policy reforms that need to happen. And one of the big aspects is the universal health coverage, of course, that needs to take into account maternal health, essential reproductive health services, and sexual and reproductive health more generally. Because on this continent right now, we know that we have over 80% of people, of Africans who are living without any kind of coverage by any pension, social protection program, or social safety net. So I think that's the major priority. Particularly when you know that in terms of health expenditure, we have about 11 million people that fall into poverty each year 
because of the high level of their direct health payments. So protecting people from getting into poverty because of that, because of the cost of health services is really a priority. So I think advocacy for and support and investment for universal health coverage is a major priority. Great, th th thank you, Vanessa. And that it really um, makes the case that you opened with really healthy populations and healthy women leads to more productive uh, populations and much more uh, productive enabling environments for women to thrive and where health really is a key pillar, both in delivery, but also health as uh, a well-being aspect too. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, turn it back to Andrea. Thank you, uh, Ropa. We, we're now going to move to Dr. Mwenya Kasonde. Welcome, Mwenya. Very, very nice to have you with us. You're the co-chair of the Gender Equity Hub at Women in Global Health. I have a very short question. Um, first question. Uh, what are some of your reflections on the triple dividend? So we are going back to the introductory remarks from Ropa just now, but maybe you could just deepen our insights on the triple dividend. Thank you, Andrea. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to Women in Global Health and Women in Global Health Norway for, for coordinating this very important discussion, which I'm delighted to be a part of. Andrea, in order to answer your question, I'm going to start by telling you a tiny little bit about myself. When I was doing my A-levels back in secondary school, I was preparing to apply for university. And my father came to me and he asked me, which medical schools will you be applying to? I said, Daddy, I've not yet decided what I want to study. He said, which medical schools will you be applying to? <laughs> the year is now 2020. The world is facing one of the greatest global health, social and economic crises that I have certainly ever seen. And Andrea, right now, I'm glad I have a medical degree. Demand for health services has increased exponentially during this pandemic and will continue to increase, creating millions of new jobs. The WHO predicts a, for, a shortfall of 18 million health workers in order to meet the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. The UN further recommends the stimulation of, of at least 40 million jobs in the health and social sector not only to meet the SDGs, but also to achieve universal health coverage and national health goals. Across OECD countries, employment in health and social work grew by 48% between the years 2000 and 2014, while jobs in industry and agriculture declined. Simply put, the health sector is a key economic sector a job generator and a driver of inclusive economic growth. As such, the health and social workforce is certainly one of the most important investments that we must make in this century. And the importance of this investment can be summarized through what we are calling the triple dividend. So firstly, let's talk about the health dividend. Millions of new jobs created in health and social care will meet a growing demand, respond to demographic changes, and assist to deliver universal health coverage. As was pointed out by a previous speaker, no country can develop without a healthy citizenry. In fact, one extra year of life expectancy has shown to raise GDP per capita by about 4%. Poor health and nutrition in earlier life will hinder cognitive development and worsen educational outcomes. Secondly, let's talk about the gender equality dividend. 70% of the global health workforce is female. Today, women are the main providers of care, including in health emergencies, humanitarian crises, and conflict settings. As such, investment in women and the education of girls to enter formal paid, equally paid, I might add, add, add work, will increase gender equality and simply promote women's empowerment. In turn, this will improve family education, nutrition, women and children's health and other aspects of development. Finally, let's touch on the development dividend. New jobs will fuel economic growth. Not only that, but the health sector delivers direct and indirect economic value through its multiply effects on the wider economy. By establishing infrastructure, purchasing equipment, supplies and pharmaceuticals, etc. 
In 2014, total pharmaceutical revenues worldwide had exceeded one trillion US dollars for the first time. According to Forbes magazine, pharmaceuticals and biotechnology are two of the world's most profitable industries ahead of IT services and banking. The health economy is playing an increasingly important role in inclusive economic growth and therefore sustainable development. I'm delighted that you've brought policymakers as well as funding agencies and implementers here today, because having said all of this, none of these benefits will be felt unless we work towards it together. We must promote a multi-stakeholder collaboration approach at national, regional and global level to align and support investment in the health workforce, particularly in, theme, in women in the health workforce. There's a famous quote that says, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. National governments led by ministries of health must accelerate implementation and reporting of national health workforce accounts. We must undertake re robust analyses of health labor markets, not only to strengthen e evidence, but also for accountability and most importantly, for action. Th thanks a lot, um, Wenya, for giving us this very broad picture of what should be done and, and all too often um, we have to say is actually not uh, being done. I have one last question for you. What, what more can you say about why investment in human resources for health is essential in these times more than ever? So with a clear uh, focus on these times, COVID-19, etc. So what are your thoughts about that? So COVID-19 has been a crisis for us in many ways. Of course, it's put pressure on health systems. It's also put pressure on women as main providers of care, both formally and informally. And it's put pressure on economies. So now, more, now is, is, is more important than ever in terms of having to maintain that triple dividend, having to invest where it matters and where we're going to make a difference, not just in creating sustainable health care systems, especially during this time, but also rebuild, rebuilding our economies and, of course, supporting women's empowerment. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I had to unmute myself as well. Now, thanks a lot, Wenya. This was really very insightful. Uh, and the triple dividend certainly is a concept that should be applied, uh, I personally think, to um, more circumstances, to more scenarios, more situations than it is currently. So it is a very attractive uh, concept that uh, policymakers, stakeholders should really, really take on board. Um, and you have shown us that very... Um, uh, very nicely, uh, also very drastically, I think you have given us good numbers. And as you say, numbers are at times helpful because uh, then you know what we can do better or, or where we have been not good enough. So thanks a lot, Wenya. And I will just hand uh, back to Rupa. And we are doing really good with time, just as a, as a quick uh, uh, heads up in terms of time. Great. Uh, thank you, Moenia, and thank you, Andrea. So um, last but not least, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Lydia Correa, the Project Officer at AMRAF Health Africa. We are really fortunate to have a frontline perspective joining us today. And Lydia, um, during these times, um, you know, particularly, can you share with us experiences where you would like to see more opportunities, um, especially uh, for women in health, women in the health workforce um, during the current pandemic? Can you give us examples or what are some of the resources that, that you think are, are needed at the front line to really ensure that you're getting um, the same opportunities and really um, that there is gender transformative change happening uh, for women in the health workforce. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited uh, to be part of this discussion, um, representing the voice of healthcare workers and especially women in the healthcare uh, workforce. Um, and I am um, one of the things that we really appreciate as healthcare workers, and I am really thankful that part of the panelists are healthcare workers um, at high level. Uh, working at the service delivery level, we require a lot of resources, and we appreciate the fact that we have come. One of the resources that uh, women require, of course, is uh, to have time that we are able to both uh, 
participate in the workforce, be able to offer service delivery, but we also have time to be able to and uh, uh, do the other work that we do in terms of nurturing and taking care of the families. So women in the um, healthcare system, when the managers and those who make decisions, you know, are locating duties and shifts need to be considerate about the women who are both offering service delivery at the healthcare level and are also uh, offering services to their families. That is a very important uh, resource in terms of time so that we have policies that enable us to have enough time, for example, after childbirth to be able to take care of the children, um, enough maternity uh, leave, and uh, when we resume back to work, flexible working hours so that we can be able to do both, take care of the families and also offer our services. And I think um, in terms of uh, training, um, a lot of training is required for both women and men in the healthcare workforce so that we can offer services uh, using the evidence-based interventions. We know that medicine is dynamic dynamic, things keep changing, and a lot of resources that we require would uh, come in terms of training, on-job uh, training, mentorship, and supportive supervision, so that all the time um, we are, are kept updated on the new things that are coming up so that we can offer uh, interventions that are evidence-based. I think the other thing that I would uh, appreciate as a healthcare worker, what I see lacking among uh, myself and the rest of my colleagues is uh, enough training on uh, data demand, information and use. We generate a lot of data uh, as we work, as we interact with the communities, but then there is that uh, weakness in terms of using that data to be able to understand it and uh, use it to make improvement or use it so that we can be able to um, apply effective approaches um, and also address the constraints and the things that maybe cause the healthcare workers at the lowest level from utilizing that data. So I think that our training would be very important so that we are not just generators of data, we don't just generate data, but we also are able to use it to improve our services. And I think I would tie that with the continuous quality improvement, which is a very key, if it is part of a training programs, so that whatever we, the services and the interventions we are offering, we can keep uh, tracking them, we can keep monitoring, and then we can keep improving. Because sometimes we offer services, you know, maybe the same way as you are trained, yet uh, populations are different. But when you apply continuous quality interventions, um, uh, and training on that is very important because sometimes um, someone is willing to do to improve, but they don't know how to probably, you know, analyze uh, the problem and come up with solutions. So I think our training in terms of our continuous quality improvement and that is tying in together with data uh, demand and uh, information use, those two are very key uh, so that we are able to um, uh, offer services and offer interventions that are not just you know, interventions as we we got them from training, but interventions depending or that are depending on the population that we are serving. So I think that is part of uh, uh, the support that we would require. And uh, Lydia, thank you for getting very specific about uh, the needs that you're seeing from a health worker perspective. Do you notice already um, any particular gender differences in access to opportunities? Um, uh, do you feel that it, as a woman you're uh, getting more opportunities than before or less or anything that you can share on some of the gender differences that you're seeing um, in the health sector from a uh, person that's participating in the workforce? Um, opportunities I would uh, um, appreciate that the fact that we have come a long way. Uh, in my uh, years of experience, uh, women um, in healthcare system, we are getting more opportunities, um, but sometimes you may be denied that opportunity as a woman because of the other demands that you may, you may have within especially uh, the workforce where we are many women. I'm a nurse by profession, and the nursing profession has more women than men, as uh, it has been alluded before. But sometimes you may find in terms of growth and opportunity, sometimes women may be denied opportunities because you also 
you know, not there full time. For example, at uh, our earlier years, we are, we are, at, um, are, are getting our children and taking care of them. So you have to be at, out of work for some time. And by the time you are back, you know, an opportunity may have uh, passed you by because you had to take care of the other um, um, nurturing work of the children. So I think um, if our governments, if policymakers, as they make those decisions, can consider that even as healthcare workers, with the demand uh, of our work, we also have the demand of a family. And since we are the caretakers, then we need to be offered opportunities uh, that will also allow us to multitask and be able to do both. And women are very good at uh, multitasking. So we will be able to take up the opportunities as they come to us. Great, thank you, Lydia. And a very clear message there about, uh, you know, there is a demand for the health healthcare and health workforce aspect of it, but there's also demand for uh, social care and care responsibilities at home and that health systems um, to be gender equitable really should be factoring in um, the life course and the ways that women intersect with life and the health systems. Um, we often say in, in Women in Global Health that uh, health systems were designed by men for men, but in, in the 21st century, women are the drivers of health. They are uh, making a majority of the health, health system, so we really need to start reshaping the health system for all genders. Um, so your message was quite clear on that, Lydia. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to um, turn it back in, uh, to Andrea. We are entering uh, the uh, Q&A session and so really encourage all of you tuning in from uh, around the world to please send in our uh, send in your questions uh, we're really excited to dive a bit deeper and hear from our panelists thank you Rupa and also thank you Lydia for your very uh, insightful remarks uh, from the grassroots uh, so to say and um, we're gonna start the Q&A session as Rupa just said please uh, don't be disappointed if we cannot discuss all of your questions. We need to pick some questions um, and uh, I hope we don't do any injustice to anyone. I will start with a question that I think is appropriate for actually two of our panelists. And maybe we can do a, a small experiment. I would like the State Secretary and also Dr. Robalo uh, Silva to answer that. The question is from Tang Tang, and uh, most likely she's from Myanmar, um, if she's the woman I think she is. And she wants to know, at a political level, I assume, at a systems political level, how do you convince the system about the different but positively different perspectives of men and women when it comes to health financing? health expenditure, policy making, peace building, and its importance of equality in their role to participate and to contribute to the system. So I understand the question, how do you pitch to the political system? How do you create the narrative that it is positive for the system? And Tang Tang has given us all these different areas, financing, health expenditure, policy making, that there needs to be equity and equality uh, for decision making between uh, women and men. Uh, Dr. Robalo Silva, would you like to start? And then I would like to uh, ask the State Secretary to follow uh, with a couple of sentences. Thank you. Thank you for that um, uh, very important question. I think um, it is not uh, a straight forward um, um, solution. We don't have a straightforward solution. We, we need to, to act in several um, angles. Education is one such important and um, across the board element that we need to always keep in mind uh, that unless we elevate the level of education of our communities, of our women and of our societies, it'll take a while before we get everything else done. Secondly, I think the way our decision-making uh, structures are uh, constituted um, are the per se uh, a barrier for understanding uh, some of the needs that uh, the other 50% of humanity uh, needs. Most of the board um, uh, of directors, the decision-making bodies are made up of men. And I think that imbalance in terms of gender already brings a bias 
in the way uh, some of these challenges are perceived and how they are resolved or solutions for them are sought when uh, the thinking around um, the research for solutions is not diverse enough uh, to consider the requirements and the needs of the adult of humanity. And I think uh, finally, um, if I can, um, uh, I can uh, bring uh, this to, uh, to the table, uh, the health sector, uh, health financing and health investment will continue to be seen as an expenditure particularly in uh, countries where uh, the economies are not so strong for them to reap the dividends of the, the health sector as well. Uh, I think COVID-19 brought to us, uh, again, some of the, uh, uh, um, I'm looking for the right to work, um, the disconnect between the right investment in the health sector and the outcomes that you can get, uh, both on the social and the economy. Everyone now should be able to understand that unless you have a good health system, your economy will run dry. Uh, this is what we are having, the huge impact a health pandemic, uh, um, uh, this pandemic is uh, causing on the, econo the economy. I hope it's a good lesson for everyone that it is important to invest. Uh, health financing, health investment is important. Thank well, you. I hope I, I addressed the time. Thanks a lot, Marta. That was very, uh, very, very interesting and then very broad perspective that you gave us. I just want to very quickly ask the State Secretary also to um, tell us his view from maybe more the male perspective. So how can you pitch to um, governments, political systems, that there needs to be equity or equality when it comes to gender for decision making in global health? Um, so uh, Mr. State Secretary, please. We cannot hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, I think when, when, when uh, uh, I mean, the economic uh, growth of Norway and, and, and in many ways, uh, the economic success of Norway is based on, on the, that we early got in the, the, the female workforce in society. And, and, um, and when, when I travel around, I really showed this, this is, you think it's the oil that is our, is the basis for our, our economy, but, but really where, where we, when we, when we had our, our major rise in economy is when we get the female workforce in for, into all parts of society. So, so, so this is, uh, is key, both it's, it's, it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart economically thing to do. And, and from, uh, from, from, um, I also believe, uh, as my colleague said, that education is, is, is a key part of this. Um, when it comes to practically uh, how you can um, change the system from a political perspective, I think we, we really need to have clear strategies, clear goals, and then keep, uh, keep all levels of leadership accountable. Uh, that's the only way to to really change uh, this this the system uh, on, when it comes to gender equality. Clear goals and clear accountability systems. Oh, thank you, State Secretary, and back over to Rupa. I think. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, for you know, just diving a little bit more, we are getting some um, interesting questions about the economic aspects and what we, what we can anticipate, especially um, I'd like to turn back to Vanessa. Uh, this question is very much targeted around uh, women will generally bear the brunt of economic downturns, especially as we are heading toward um, global recession. Uh, what are some of the main 
threats that you're seeing and how can we best mitigate against them? And um, I'd like to add, how can uh, we really, you know, build on the point that what Moenia was talking about earlier, that the health sector is growing. It is a, um, a, 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 a fueling sector for both jobs and jobs for women particularly. Uh, but we also know that um, innovation and some of those other aspects that you talked about. So how can we use the health sector to mitigate risks, especially for women and to keep, keep things gender equitable? Well, thanks, Rupa. And, you know, as you mentioned, during the economic crisis, so major crisis is, I can't even say looming, it's not looming anymore. It's really very much upon us. And here on the continent, even though if to date, the sanitary impact in terms of known cases seems to be lower than in other regions of the world, we very, very much feel the economic impact already of some of the confinement measures, et cetera. I mean, just to give you an example that I like to use, you realize that over 40% of our populations rely for their livelihoods on cross-border trade, over 40%. So when you close borders, you're cutting over 40% of the population from the access to what provides uh, you know, for them on a daily basis and their families. So we're seeing a huge economic impact. And as always, the most vulnerable are the ones that suffer the most. And women are disproportionately affected by the crisis. They're actually a number, a majority in many of the sectors I mentioned, including the health sector. And so I think the important question that we've been grappling with, that I've been grappling with in particular is like, how are we rebuilding? How are we going to do things differently? You know, there's a saying by Einstein, I believe, uh, that is attributed to him that says continuing doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is insanity. So what are we going to change in the way we invest to have a different result if there's a crisis, when the next crisis occurs? Because that's the story of humanity. And I think we need to very deliberately tackle inequalities. Because this is what we're seeing. And inequalities are really the red thread of all human struggle. You know, every time you have inequality, something happens, some people suffer more. That creates social unrest. I mean, it's, we could say the story on over and over again. And I think in order to reach inclusive development, sustainable development, access to opportunity for all, we need to very deliberately tackle inequality in all of our interventions, particularly gender inequality. And that means targeted interventions. The High Commissioner earlier referred to more investment. You know, these areas that are underinvested in health systems, gender equality specifically, targeted interventions with bigger shares of our budgets, all of us, to go towards that will make a difference. Another thing that needs to change or that needs to improve is civil society engagement in everything we do to ensure that all solutions that are developed really, really respond to the community's specific needs. And no one knows better what needs, what is needed by a community than actual members of that community. And you see women driving that, you know, uh, and you go to most countries in Africa and you'll see strong women's associations at the village or the city level. They need to be engaged in everything we do. And the last point I'd like to make is around the digital aspect. You know, uh, I think from the economic perspective, the businesses that survive the best during the crisis are the ones that have access to the internet that manage to keep an online presence. And we saw how internet is one of the greatest equalizers as well nowadays. So we need to ensure increased access to these digital services so everybody can get online. And it's not just for good business. We've seen the impact of uh, the internet on other things like education during the crisis with kids being able for the ones that had access to continue attending school and on health. You know, I mean, you know better than I do. The telemedicine, providing access to some services to the people that will not, at least in the foreseeable future, have access to any type of physical health facility. So I think this is extremely important to accelerate as well and to think about innovations that can help us do things differently. Great. Thank, thank you, Vanessa. And, and that's uh, really critical that you're saying that we need to look at multiple um, sectors and increase investments to really miti mitigate the risk, uh, the risk and keep it gender equitable. And so, you know, another um, aspect of the strategy, especially I'd like to turn back um, to Norway and um, State Secretary um, Axel, uh, really, you know, particularly Norway at the end of last year launched a strategy for non-communicable diseases. And we know that this is um, a universal issue that needs to be addressed and uh, leads to a double, triple burden of disease in many settings that was included in part of your development agenda. Um, how could this new and unique strategy be used to lift the female health workforce and um, really promote uh, gender transformative change? Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, our new strategy on, on non-communicable diseases is, is very, I think is, is very important agenda and, and we really need to, to mobilize it around it globally. Uh, and and uh, we are going to invest more in this field going forward. Of course, at this point in time, we, we are, it's hard to talk about uh, anything else than the, the pandemic and its consequences. Uh, I, 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 would, I would lift it up. I think as, as Norway, we, we have a gender as a cross-cutting theme for oral or development work. And, and I think that's the way to work, that we really need to, to put it at the top of the agenda in every field where we are working, because uh, it's, it's, it is a key. It's a key in the agricultural sector where, where, where women are, are seldom, they are doing most of the work, but they are not listened to when the, when the decisions are made. That's that's wrong, and we can see that from sector to sector. So, so, so my overall answer to that is that we need to have gender at the center of everything we do, and, and has it as a cross-cutting theme in in any intervention. And and of course, uh, the non-communicable diseases strategy. I, I think we really need to mobilize around that for the future. And and of course, the, the female health workforce will be central to that. And you know, it's really music to uh, to our ears to really hear that phrase about gender really being cross cutting and uh, applicable to every setting because that is really the lens that we want to see uh, the the world operating under and not being being gender blind about it. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to Andrea to see. You know, we, we're getting lots of questions, so it's going to be tough to get to all of them. But Andrea, um, back to you. Well, thank you, Rupa, and um, thank thank you also um, to the panelists. Um, I would like to go back to the grassroots workers and I would like to turn to Lydia and also to Wenya. And here's a question from uh, Jamila Al-Shari and she's asking now, we, we just zoom back in COVID-19, how can we empower the frontline health workers during COVID-19 pandemic with low resources? So they have low resources anyway, um, especially most of them, when especially most of them are uh, women. So the question would be uh, talking about um, um, financial support, um, investment uh, into specific areas. Um, how can this really trickle down to the grassroots frontline health workers? Lydia, I would like to start with you. Maybe you can give us some more insight and then move to Mwenya to give us some more, um, maybe more political insights into that, how that could be achieved. Uh, thank you, Adria. I think um, I'm one of the healthcare workers working in very low uh, resource uh, setting. I basically am um, based in an informal settlement um, where resources are very uh, minimal, where uh, communities, uh, most of them are no longer working, they don't have uh, livelihoods. So I think uh, one of the ways to empower um, the front healthcare workers we would uh, be do good to begin with the lowest level, the level one, the community health uh, workers. If we'll be able to empower that kind of staff, um, and I'm glad somebody has mentioned the CSOs, our community health workers are the ones that we are dependent on, on the first level of healthcare services at the community level. As a country, we are going into what is being called home-based care, where we need communities to start or families to start taking care of uh, COVID-19 positive patients who are probably asymptomatic uh, or with mild symptoms at home. And we need to really empower these women. In our setting, most community health volunteers or workers are women, uh, but you find that most of them have not been recognized as part of the healthcare system. Some of them are not even being remunerated as healthcare uh, uh, system workers, and yet we are really dependent on them. We are dependent on them for uh, them to be able to link us there. We are dependent on them to create demand uh, for services. During this COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, we realize that women or even men and children were not able to access other healthcare services, you know, like immunization, antenatal services, family planning services. You find that 
uh, people are fearing to come to health facilities. But if you would, would empower the community health uh, workers who are basically at household level, then we'll be able not to uh, not to concentrate maybe on the COVID-19 and forget and probably reverse the gains that we have made in uh, reproductive health, in immunization and family planning. So I think one of the ways that we can be able to empower these uh, workers is to train them, recognize them as part of a healthcare system, you know, um, capacity build them, provide them with adequate uh, personal protective equipment. That has been a challenge. These community health workers are going house to house. Um, we need to provide them with that um, adequate uh, personal protective equipment. But I think of more importance is recognize them as part of a healthcare system. And as we uh, train um, the community health nurses, the public health uh, officers in our settings, we have community health extension workers. These are frontline healthcare workers at the uh, grassroots. So I think if we capacity build them, if we empower them, if we provide them with resources, if we consider these community health uh, volunteers who basically uh, some of them are not having any other source of livelihood to benefit from the programs that we are giving to the, uh, the rest of the community. It would really motivate them to also uh, be able to do the work, the important work they do at the community level. So that would be uh, my contribution in terms of uh, taking this to the lowest level, taking this discussion to the lowest level. And COVID-19, if you realize, has a lot to do with uh, behavior change. You know, the social, physical distancing aspects, the hand hygiene, um, washing practices, you know, all those things. The community health volunteers at the grassroots level would really be key to help our communities to understand the pandemic and to understand how to respond to it. Well, thanks a lot, Lydia. I think you have, uh, you have really um, shown us very lively how important the grassroots level is and, and the grassroots level very often is left behind. Um, and it, 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 our policy is actually to leave no one behind, um, also not the grassroots level. So I would like to hear just um, from, from Menya very quickly, give us the broad picture and what actually could be done to bring the grassroots uh, workers more to the forefront. So the frontline workers to the forefront also of, of policy and making decision making, but also financial investment and support. And then um, if, if Vanessa could just conclude a couple of sentences on, on how this could be done uh, practically um, and, and, and what, what maybe good examples you have, what has worked already. So first to Mwenya, please, and then to Vanessa, and just a couple of sentences. Thank you, thank you, Andrea. Um, you've asked for a short answer to a very complicated question. Um, there are so many ways in which we can address this issue. It is such an important issue. And I'm so glad that we've heard from Lydia here to give us really you know, her first-hand experience on just how important uh, frontline healthcare workers are. And in a lot of ways, community health workers in, in a lot of our lower middle income uh, you know, settings, community health workers do really you know, create the, back, or the backbone of the system. They just touched on a very important point so one or two other people have, have done so as well. Um, number one being on education. It's so important that we educate, train, and, and empower our healthcare workers, our frontline healthcare workers, um, in that way. And education starts at the very beginning. By that I mean it starts all the way from primary school to secondary school to tertiary education to continuous professional education. For girls especially, we're seeing girls, especially in some of the more low middle income countries, for example, I'm from Zambia, we have a lot of girls dropping out of secondary school in particular because of issues such as child marriage or issues such as period poverty. So all these very complicated socioeconomic and cultural issues in a lot of ways need to be addressed to ensure that we educate girls from the very beginning, from the very, very beginning of the world. That's the first thing I want to say. And secondly, we of course need to invest in safe work. Remember healthcare workers also themselves must be healthy in order to perform the work that they do. Um, about 6% of COVID-19 cases are in healthcare workers. We need to invest in making sure that our healthcare workforce is safe, making sure they have appropriate PPE and staying away from any sort of harassment, be it physical or sexual harassment, et cetera, as they try to carry out their work. 
And I think in a lot of ways, policymakers, of course, have a key role to play. And again, I'll give you a Zambian example. We recently passed in Zambia what we call the Nurse and Midwives Bill. What the Nurse and Midwives Bill does primarily, primarily is recognize the fact that nurses, midwives, community health workers do form the backbone of many health systems, especially in the communities. And the, what it's trying to achieve is to empower them legally to be able to do the work that they do. So now, for example, in Zambia, nurses are allowed to prescribe medication legally, which they have been doing throughout our times, but they've just not had a legal framework to protect them. So a lot of ways, in, 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 in a lot of issues that we need to focus on, education, number one, policy, of course, course and safe work are the three that I'm going to focus on today. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot Moina. Uh, in, the, in the interest of time um, I would just very quickly move to Vanessa uh, with some concluding remarks on that question. So how can we lift up the grassroots workers policy-wise and also investment-wise? Thank you so much Andrea and in fact when Lydia was speaking I was just nodding my head because that's exactly I think she, she was pointing to a failure of the system. You know community health workers, CSOs, civil society organizations, community-based associations. They were there from day one. They innovated, they were on the front line supporting populations and communities with very scarce resources. And yes, there is a need to, for support for capacity building, but also for access to finance to scale some of their initiatives that are better than anything we could ever imagine from a central perspective. But the system lacks adequate instruments to do that right now. And it's not easy because we're talking about thousands of organizations across the continent. But that's not good enough and so we need to improve at the african development bank we've actually recently created a division a team that looks at civil society engagement is one of my teams we have two sides one is gender and women empowerment but the other side is just that engaging civil society and looking at social innovation solutions so we can work better together uh, to know and recognize them better as lydia was saying so we've put together a database that right now has over 3,000 organizations uh, from all across the continent. We need to add Lydia's organization if it's not in there, because that's one means to communicate, to look at which development priorities they're working on. We've established a committee, we have a forum, we were doing webinars during the crisis. But as I was saying, we need to go further. We're trying to work with CSOs at the country level, particularly to look at which operations, where CSOs can come in as implementing partners, because of their comparative advantage, because all of this has to be done in collaboration. And, and that's where the, the projects are, you know, working with the bank and the government and the civil society organizations at the country level. But I still think that as a development community overall, there is a need for innovation. This crisis has shown it. We need to find ways to empower frontline workers much better and much faster. And uh, Lydia, I mean, all colleagues on the call, we're thinking about it, working on it. Please join the civil society community of the African Development Bank so we can also take your inputs and, and see how we can do better together. Well, thanks a lot, Vanessa. Fantastic, um, very multifaceted uh, approach and answers. Uh, just in the interest of time, I will hand uh, um, back over to, to Rupa. Rupa, we've got roughly 10 more minutes, so we are good. Okay, great. And I did want to make sure we give the panelists all a time to do one round of uh, closing um, takeaway messages. And so uh, just to, you know, one of the recurring questions that we're hearing uh, from several of our attendees is very much about uh, how do we change societal norms um, so that women and girls are valued. Um, clearly, we know that there is a challenge on the rights of women. Um, and that was some of the points that were brought up by uh, panelists today, uh, but really would like to turn to um, uh, to Magda, if you know, from the perspective that you are uh, shaping policies in your country and the experience that you have uh, more broadly working in health systems, um, how can we really start um, transforming how women and girls are valued, and how do we preserve um, their rights and uh, also advance their rights during these times? Um, thank you, uh, Rupa, for that important question. I think um, from where I sit, um, there is a huge amount of work we need to do on in addressing social norms. Uh, I think uh, each and every policy in each and every sector needs to uh, be mindful of the social norms that are preventing women, young girls from uh, having access 
uh, to power, to leadership, to the fulfillment of the aspirations and ambitions. Uh, if we don't work uh, across the board in a constructive manner, in a deliberate manner, to address that and put women on the path they should be, who will be here 200 years talking about the same topic. There is one important element that uh, came into be during this uh, pandemic. The digital divide uh, showed us clearly that we need to work a lot to uh, bridge the gaps uh, between the haves and don't haves in terms of access to internet. Uh, we have seen uh, how difference, big difference, the access to internet has uh, changed the way we are dealing with this pandemic. And women are left behind here also. So um, my takeaway message um, uh, for everyone is we still need to work on social norms. The racism debate that is ravaging along the pandemic is again another issue that complicates all the debate around the triple dividend. And I think it's part of the social norms that we uh, grow up with. Uh, so addressing social norms in all policies will be the way to go. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Magda, for, for that insightful, um, you know, really like rooting out, uh, you know, the challenges around gender norms. Um, I'd like to uh, turn it to Andrea to uh, just facilitate the, uh, the wrap up aspect of it. Yeah, no, thank, thanks Rupa, you, you're right. I think we need uh, to move towards the final a quick statement uh, round. Um, we were not able to ask at least 10 of very, very good and insightful questions. So apologies to the audience, but it's fantastic that we had over 100 uh, listeners. Thanks to the particip participants. Please stay with us still. We have some final remarks and then also some conclusion from, uh, from Ropa. So I would like, uh, maybe Magda, we can just stay with you. Um, I just go again consecutively the way we started. Uh, Magda, just a couple of quick sentences. What is the most important that uh, you have already said your takeaway message, but what is the most important that our participants should uh, memorize and retain when they walk away from, from the webinar? I think inclusiveness uh, is uh, something we need to um, work on. Uh, it's not just civil society, private sector, health sector, uh, economic sector. We need uh, a multidisciplinary and whole sectors uh, collaboration uh, in order to have uh, real transformative uh, policies to change the way um, gender equality is being addressed. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Robalo Silva. It was a pleasure to have you on the panel. We move then to, uh, next was Vanessa Mongar. So Vanessa, if you would like to unmute and just give us your take home messages, please. Thanks, Andrea. Well, I think we've made the case for health as a powerful lever for many other development outcomes. And we know there'll be a shift in investment because of this crisis towards health system strengthening. So we must ensure that that is done with gender equality at the heart of it. So the societies can reap the benefits of the triple dividend that we've been discussing. And so that's the importance of mainstreaming gender. I think the state secretary refer referred to that before in health, but across all sectors. And I also love the point that the high commissioner just made on addressing social norms. You know, so much work still needs to be done at the, on the continent. It has to be led by African women and men themselves. You know, and our cultures and traditions are something we really get a lot of pride from, derive a lot of pride from, but I always say we need to celebrate the ones that help us, that make, you know, help us move forward, and we need to get rid of the ones that hold us back. And some of the social norms of protecting women and girls are holding us back. And, you know, having influential women, role models, like the High Commissioner, like Lydia, like Mwani, like all of us. And it was actually a very feminine panel, I have to say, also is part of addressing the social norms and the unconscious bias we all have within us so that girls realize from an early age that they can do anything. And our job 
whether we're government, CSOs, development finance institutions, is to make sure that we give them access to the tools to be anything they want to do. Thanks a lot, Vanessa. Um, let's just move in the interest of time to the next uh, panelist. I would like to call um, to ask Wenya Kassonde, please, to give your final remarks, your closing remarks. Thanks, Andrea. And I think really everything has been said, um, but I want to echo um, Vanessa's words on country driven approaches. I think we need to be specific about specific country contexts. Um, and I'm glad that we have policymakers here on the call with us um, in order to, to encourage those country driven, -driven uh, approaches. Um, and for me, the take home is really back to, to the triple dividend. We have a great opportunity here, a great opportunity to rebuild our health systems, to re empower women. And to, and to rebuild our economies in a very significant way. Thank you. Thanks, Wenya, for this very concise uh, conclusion. Last but not least, uh, Lydia Kuria. Uh, Lydia, would you like to give us uh, your last remarks before then we move to Rupa's closing remarks? It was a great Lydia. discussion, and um, yeah, it was a great discussion. I'm excited, and uh, one of the things I think I would want to see is that we move. Uh, the discussions now from the boardrooms so that now our communities can start benefiting from the great uh, discussions that have been happening. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Lydia. This was very concise as well. Thanks, thanks a lot uh, to the panelists. Uh, the State Secretary sent an excuse that uh, he had to leave early, unfortunately, because he has got uh, a meeting in Parliament that he has to attend, obviously. So uh, let, let me thank again also, of course, uh, the Norwegian Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs um, and State Secretary Axel Jakobsen for uh, giving us his uh, insights and also his support, uh, as I uh, understood, to move forward with uh, the uh, equity agenda. And uh, to all the panelists, a really, really warm thank you. I think it's a fantastic group. We should not, this should not have been the last time that we met. Uh, you have really given us so much insight from different perspectives with lots of heart, with lots of warmth and lots of enthusiasm. I think this is what we need. And last but not least, um, thanks a lot to our team in the background, uh, which is the team from the Center for Global Health. Uh, uh, Ingeborg Hovetsen and uh, Gabriela Rodriguez, that's really fantastic for facilitating this again. And last but not least, again to Ropa Dat. Thanks a lot, Ropa. It's always a pleasure to do something with you. And now the floor is yours for at least eight more minutes. So <laughs> no, take a deep bite. <laughs> I'm going to follow, follow all, all the wonderful panelists and, and, and keep it concise. But um, again, echoing the sentiment that, especially during these times that we're all challenged, really appreciate all the panelists. For prioritizing this particular discussion, this particular topic. Um, and really, you know, when closing, what I'd like to do is just remind all of us that we set out a very ambitious agenda when we decided the sustainable development goals, and one that we should not uh, let go of, and an, an ambitious agenda where gender equality, achieving universal health coverage, having decent jobs, all the things that we've been talking about um, were, were really commitments that governments made and that were driven by citizens. And so as we are facing the global pandemic, uh, health is in top agenda of every government. Um, and uh, we're fortunate to have uh, those perspectives being shared today and, you know, echoing some of the words shared by the panelists that this is our opportunity to ensure that we really can accelerate uh, gender equity. We know that estimates show anywhere from 100 to 200 years to close the gender gap. Um, the conversation today really focused on um, the Africa subcontinent. Specifically, uh, we were inspired uh, by uh, the progress agenda and the women's leadership so really echoing that we need to be context specific country specific and some of the points really raised about um, you know challenging the norms by highlighting the women that are really leading um, there are many opportunities uh, and we heard from our panelists today that uh, these opportunities uh, are um, 
clearly in challenging times, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be pushing the gender equity agenda, especially for the health workforce um, and the social workforce, which there truly is an opportunity um, to have a return on investment, um, to see economic growth, but also a rights agenda um, being achieved. So there's, there's a multiplier effect. Um, we heard about the positive feedback loop. Um, we can't be talking about uh, decent jobs without really acknowledging that we need um, healthy people and healthy populations. And then to keep people healthy, um, uh, we also need a healthy workforce and social workforce. We heard perspectives from our frontline um, community health worker, Lydia, really sharing that there are, are, are really tough day-to-day -day questions um, and tough realities that women in the health workforce have to make decisions between um, family and uh, providing social care um, to providing health care and that we can do better to create health systems that help um, support our health workers uh, not only in training opportunities but really the demands that they have in multiple angles um, and it, we were also reminded that decent jobs are not a cost but they're truly an investment we know that when um, there is uh, decent working conditions, uh, free from uh, violence, um, equitable pay, uh, uh, equal access to leadership opportunities, um, and really addressing issues of segregation um, by gender, occupational segregation, we know that um, there's going to be even a greater return on, on investment. Um, and then uh, finally, in closing, I'd like to really say is that today's conversation, we really talked about the triple dividend um, from the perspectives of really bringing the sectors uh, that support the health sector, which is um, really the finance sector, the development sector and the health sector. And this is uh, meant to be really first of many conversations that help sectors really have a conversation where we can work together and we can see these investments in the health sector and in the health workforce not as competitive but actually complementary and that the triple dividend will accelerate the sustainable development goals, it will help us achieve health and well-being, gender equality, quality education, um, decent work, and inclusive economic growth. Uh, so on that note, I'd really like to, again, um, emphasize, let's continue uh, working on these issues at the global, regional, and most important uh, local level. And thank you to our panelists for really uh, joining in and uh, giving us deep in insights into this process. And uh, a special thanks to the co-host, uh, Women in Global Health Norway, um, and the team there that's uh, made this all possible. Thanks. Thanks a lot. The, the webinar is closed. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, -bye.